Hey everybody, I'm Elise Explosion and I would like to welcome you to the final compilation of all five parts to the Jersey Diner Challenge. Now if you followed along from the beginning, this is nothing new, but sometimes you kind of want to just sit down and watch it all at once. So everybody sit back, grab yourself a hot cup of coffee and a nice plate of disco fries and enjoy. In this video, join Mr. Explosion and I as we travel through southern New Jersey to find the best diner in the region. There are some highs, there are some lows, and you're not going to want to miss this. Hey everybody, I'm Elise Explosion and I am so, so excited to share this with you. Back in January, Mr. Explosion, my dear husband Michael, came to me with an amazing idea. What if, over the bleak winter months, we went on a series of mini road trips throughout our home state to find the best diner in New Jersey. Now, this is no small task. New Jersey is the diner capital of the United States. There are over 530 diners within the state as of August of 2023. Visiting 530 diners was absolutely not on the table, but visiting a single standout diner from each county? Now that was definitely a bit more manageable. To make our list, we scoured Google and Yelp reviews, local newspaper listicles, and of course, watched hours upon hours of diners, drive-ins, and dives. We narrowed it down to one diner in each county, with a handful of backups just in case something had closed in the meantime. We decided that each diner would get a score out of 20, then be faced off in a college basketball-style showdown. To do this, we've split the state into four regions, North, Central, South, and Shore. For this purpose, whether you believe in it or not, Central Jersey does exist. Diners will be scored on a rubric of four categories. First, food. Flavor, portion size, and appearance all come into play here. Next, ambiance. How dinery does this diner feel? Is it clean, crowded, modern, retro? All important factors. Third, cost. Are the prices reasonable for the food that you get? Do they reflect the quality, portions, and any extras? And finally, the bonus category is kind of a catch-all. Here we award points based on the dessert that we've gotten, but also if there's any like repute behind the diner. Was it on diners, drive-ins, and dives? Have local newspapers raved about it in their best diners of the state? We'll find out. In this video, we will be visiting the South region, which comprises of five counties, Burlington, Camden, Gloucester, Cumberland, and Salem. To make this easier on ourselves, we decided to do this all in one weekend. Three diners in one day, two on the next. Are you ready? Let's go. These will be scored out of five for a total of 20 possible points. In this video, we will be visiting the South region, which comprises of five counties for our purposes. Burlington, Camden, Gloucester, Cumberland, and Salem. To make this a bit easier on us, because it's a bit far of a drive, we decided to do this all in one weekend, with an overnight stay in between. Three diners on one day, two on the next. So with all that being said, let us begin. Our first stop on this leg of the trip is Olga's Diner in Marshall, New Jersey. Olga's was a bit legendary in Burlington County. The original Olga's opened in 1946, but closed its doors in 2008 due to delinquent tax payments. The new Olga's is unrelated to the original, but more sort of using the name to keep the spirit alive. The first stop in our South Division started off strong with a fantastic looking specials board and bakery case to match. I ordered the daily special Oreo pancakes with a side of pork roll, and Michael ordered the Italian pork sandwich with a side of fries. We got there early enough that we were only given a breakfast menu, but thankfully there were ample brunch offerings as well. Further research into the menu shows that there is actually a full vegan menu alongside lunch and dinner specials. Our food arrived fairly quickly and looked amazing. My pancakes were light, fluffy, and creamy, just the way I like them, and the pork roll was flavorful and grilled perfectly. Michael's sandwich, however, was just not as show-stopping. The pork was moist and there was a ton of cheese, but the jus served alongside was pretty flavorless. Hang on, do I want to put syrup on it first? I don't know. Let's try it with that. Yeah, go with that. They're as fluffy as they look. They're pretty fluffy. Yeah, that's a nice fluffy pancake. Good? It's good. Alright. I decided to challenge myself in the sandwich and the au jus. Oh, that looks so good, though. It does look good. Alright, and the dip. And the drip. 
Like my late great-grandmother would say, it tastes like the pig ran through it. Fries were pretty standard. For dessert, Michael picked out a blue character cupcake themed after our favorite cookie-eating preschool pal to go. This was a tough one for me. Michael had no issue, but to me, the cake was dry and crumbly and the frosting tasted like Crisco. Our meal came to a total of $40.47 before tip and dessert, which felt a bit pricey for what we got. Final score? Food, 3.5. Ambiance, 4. Cost, 2.5. Bonus, 2.5. For a total of 12.5 out of 20. We had some time to kill between our meals, so we traveled south to Glassboro in Gloucester County. Glassboro is the home of not only our next diner, but also Rowan University. Figuring there might be something interesting to do in a college town, we pulled into the Heritage Glass Museum, a cool community nonprofit museum featuring information on and unique pieces of Southern New Jersey's long and storied history with glass making and glass artistry. It's called Glassboro for a reason, after all. The museum is only open for a few hours every Saturday, but within its walls is a truly colorful and beautiful history lesson. Glassmaking in the United States got its start in southern New Jersey due in part to the abundant natural materials in the Pine Barrens. Wood, sand, soda ash, and silica. Many glassmaking factories existed in the area even through the late 1990s. The staff was super friendly and gave us a tour, showing off not only preserved pieces dating back to the 1700s, but also recovered pieces from local construction sites. This had absolutely nothing to do with diners, but was an awesome way to spend some time digesting. We saw decorative pieces, Vaseline glass, scientific equipment, molds for making shaped bottles, and a ton more. Admission is free and highly recommended. I even picked up a cool piece with the Jersey Devil on one side and the Salem Oak on the next. More on that later. We told our new friends at the museum about our endeavors, and they all suggested that we visit what was our next stop on the list. Angela's Glassboro Diner, located adjacent to the campus of Rowan University and, unbeknownst to us, literally walking distance from the museum. So we headed over, detoured by Pokemon Go raids, some fun statues on the campus, a visit to the university bookstore, and finally, lunch at Angelo's. Angelo's Glassboro Diner is a Coleman-style modular diner opened in 1946 by Angelo Tubertini. It was bought in the 1970s by the daughter of the original owner and her husband, who sold it to his present owners, a development company, in December 2023. Folks we spoke to questioned how long the diner would remain open after its purchase, but information online seems to confirm that the company has no plans to get rid of a local institution. For starters, this place is small. Intimate, some might say. It was pretty full for a Saturday afternoon, and the booths were cramped. Several spots on the interior seemed rusty, but I'm not sure if that was just regular age or lack of care. The tables were clean, and the menu was small, but definitely had a large amount of diner favorites. I ordered a Virginia ham and Swiss sandwich grilled, and Michael ordered the French toast as recommended by the crew at the Glass Museum with a side of Scrapple. Turnover was quick, and we were served relatively quickly for such a busy place. My grilled cheese was perfectly cromulent, the ham wasn't too salty, and there was ample Swiss cheese. I didn't get fries, but I did get a decent amount of pickles, which I always appreciate. All right. It's like a nice grilled cheese, right? Yeah. <laughs> Michael's French toast was also just kind of fine. Pretty generic, nothing to write home about, but the Scrapple, according to him, was great. I have yet to work up the courage to try Scrapple, so I will take his word for it. Alright. <laughs> That's good. Good. Later that night, we tried the rice pudding. They gave us a whole paper coffee cup's worth, and I was despaired to find out it was just downright inedible. I took one bite, Michael took one bite, and we tossed it in the trash. The rice was undercooked, and it had no discernible flavor to it. The truest saving grace to Angelo's is that even after tax, the meal came to less than $20. I can't spend less than $20 on two people at Wendy's these days, so this was nothing short of a miracle. Final score, food, three. Ambiance, 3.5. Cost, five. 
bonus two for a total of 13.5 out of 20. From Angelo's, we decided to check into our hotel and take a quick break before going out for our dinner. We had ample time to take a nap and get ready. We tried some desserts and rested up before heading out about half an hour south to Port Elizabeth, New Jersey and Cumberland County's offering. On the way, we passed a lot of farm fields and emptiness partnered with some weird glowing blue lights. It was a lot to take in. The Maurice River Diner is an absolute hidden gem in the middle of what feels like nowhere. You look at this place and you just know it's a diner, which is good because it is. Walking into the vestibule, you see giant ceilings, a specials board, and a claw machine, which is novel and cute. We were seated promptly and handed an extensive menu with all-day breakfast and fantastic dinner special options. I ordered the fried chicken, which came with a side of fries, corn, and a bowl of potato Tuscany soup, which the waitress described as, quote, having big slices of potato in it, end quote. Michael ordered the local blueberry pancakes with a side of pork roll, hoping for a win after the somewhat mediocre lunch he'd had. For starters, they brought us a bread basket, which feels like a rarity these days. I remember getting baskets of rolls and pats of butter all the time at diners when I was a kid, but it's not super common now. That was already a bonus. Then the food. The potato soup bread. was, in yeah. fact, extremely yeah. unique, but also probably Gold some of the best bread. soup I've ever had. There were big slices of potatoes, exactly as advertised, and it was creamy and seasoned perfectly. This is some of the best soup I've ever had. Like, legitimately, this is so fun. Good. My fried chicken may very well be the best fried chicken I have ever had in my entire life. When they say honey dipped, I don't usually expect to taste the honey, but I did and it was amazing. Fries were pretty good and corn was corn. You can't go wrong with corn. Michael's pancakes were, according to him, very good. And there were lots of big blueberries in, which is nice for being out of season. Cheeky footage. Oh, that's a good crunch. Ooh. I can taste the honey. There you go. Uh, this is legit. Nice. This is legit good. For dessert, we took a Boston cream cake home with us, which Michael loved. Cake was moist and tasty. After tax and before tip, the meal cost us around $40, which is a little pricey, but also felt reasonable for the portion size, volume, and quality of the food. I would come back here again in a heartbeat, and we may very well be. Final score? Food, 4.5. Ambiance, 4.5. Cost, 3.5. Bonus, 4.5 for a total of 17 out of 20. As we pulled into our hotel that evening, I kind of got into my own head about the project. It was such a daunting task, and I set the dumbest time limit for it. Was this going to be a mountain of unnecessary stress? Were we going to be able to get everything done in time? I looked up to see a dead diner right in front of me in the parking lot. The Prestige was a former Bennigan's that closed in 2022. By all accounts, it wasn't particularly good, but still, the specter of a dead diner loomed over me. When we got back into the room, I was greeted by Guy Fieri in a diner's drive-ins and dives marathon. I think this was the real sign. Guy crossing the country to visit small restaurants and try food? I could relate. I felt the love. I went to bed after a few hours of Triple D and woke up rested for our next day's adventures. The next stop on our list was about 40 minutes south in Salem County. The Salem Oak Diner, located across from the former Salem Oak, is a small dining car style diner. The Salem Oak itself is of significant historical importance. It was believed to have been part of the original forest that covered the county, and legend has it that in 1675, John Fenwick signed a treaty with the local Lenny Lenape tribe under the tree. Allegedly, this treaty has never been broken. The tree itself fell in 2019, but, but seedlings were given to several New Jersey municipalities in order to preserve the legacy of the once former tallest white oak tree in New Jersey. The diner itself was quaint. There were jukeboxes on every table, and though ours was broken, it felt like an early 2000s time capsule. Even though we arrived closer to 11am, we were provided only a breakfast menu, which admittedly threw off our groove a bit. Our waitress was very nice. Those are about the only nice things I can say about this place. I ordered southern style sausage biscuits and gravy with a side of pork roll. Michael went very old school diner and ordered creamed chip beef on toast. Both of our entrees came with breakfast potatoes. The first sign that something was wrong was that both of our entrees came out looking practically identical. Whatever the white gravy was that they used, it was obvious that they just took a ladle of it and poured it over both respective plates rather than having the ingredients cooked inside. And then I took a bite of my biscuits and gravy. Nice bite up there. There you go. Uh -oh. 
sausage is Italian sausage, not breakfast sausage. Friends, it was made with sweet Italian sausage, not breakfast sausage, but the kind of sausage that is better served in grandma's Sunday sauce than a breakfast plate. I am trying to be nice about this, but it was absolutely disgusting. All I could taste was the fennel. I ended up eating my potatoes and that was about it. Michael's chip beef was, according to him, extremely boring. Also, I'm not sure what they did to the toast, but if you have that much trouble cutting toast with a knife, there may be a greater issue. Sadly, the cheesecake we brought home with us, as recommended by the server, tasted like everything that had ever been in a refrigerator all at once. It. That's spackle. And it tastes like everything else that was in the refrigerator with it. <laughs> the baking soda of the dessert case, I suppose. Final score. Food, 1.5. Ambiance, 3.5. Cost, 4. Bonus, 0 0.5 for a total of 9.5 out of 20. We had one more diner before the end of the South region, and though I spent most of the drive on the phone to my parents complaining about the food crimes done to me, we ended up taking a short break at the Cherry Hill Mall in Cherry Hill. I haven't seen a mall so alive in years, and as such, the only footage I took was of this amazing blind box figure vending machine that I spent like 30 bucks in. After a couple hours, it was time for our next and final stop. Ponzio's Diner in Cherry Hill, Camden County, opened in 1964 and is easily the biggest diner we visited so far, possibly ever. It is the oldest eatery in Cherry Hill and has a handful of dining rooms, a full service bar, and a bakery case large enough to rival some actual standalone bakeries. We did have to wait for a table. It was a busy Sunday afternoon at this point, but we were seated after maybe 10 minutes. The diner just oozes retro from the wood paneling to the section marker on the wall to various chrome and neon throughout. This place has a very dedicated following, and for good reason. The menu itself was the placemat, breakfast and brunch on one side, lunch and dinner options on the other. Both of us, having been burned by the disappointment of breakfast, opted for things familiar but fresh. I went with a French dip with fries, and Michael got the cinnamon roll French toast with a side of house-made turkey sausage. The food was surprisingly pretty good. I mean, anything would have been an upgrade at this point after having such a disappointment that morning. This was a breath of fresh air. For starters, and the most ingenious thing I've ever seen a diner do, my French dip was cut into thirds so that I could just easily dip it into the jus. There was ample provolone cheese, the jus itself was flavorful and salty, just as it should be, and the roll was a true hard roll. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, it's clever to make it smart. three slices to get in there easier. Oh, nice crunch. Mm, that's good. All right, nice. Get the very... <laughs> that's really good mm. okay we got the happy dance oh yeah that's real good. the cinnamon roll french toast was a novel concept and flavorful but a little dry but the turkey sausage was according to michael perfect and that's a win in our book for dessert i picked up a sugar cookie and a small chocolate peanut butter tart Cake? Cakelet? Uh, I'm not sure what exact terminology is, but it was moist, fudgy, and absolutely delicious. The cookie was great too, but I'm not counting it as part of the dessert portion because that would be cheating. Final score. Food? Four. Ambiance? Four. Cost? 2.5. Bonus? 4.5. For a total score of 15 out of 20. The final score count for all five South Region diners is Olga's Diner, 12.5 out of 20. Angelo's Glassboro Diner, 13.5 out of 20. Maurice River Diner, 17 out of 20. Salem Oak Diner, 9.5 out of 20. And finally, Ponzio's Diner with 15 out of 20. After the scores were tallied, the winner of the South Region is Cumberland County's own Maurice River Diner with a final score of 17 out of 20. We'll be seeing you again soon, I hope. That does it for the South region. In our next video, we tackle my home region, Central. This has been a bit over a couple of days and we actually started filming it before we started doing the South, uh, but it's taken a bit longer and you'll see why. So everybody, thank you so much. Stay tuned for part two coming very soon. In this episode, we keep it close to home while checking out some of the most unique and standout diners Central Jersey has to offer. Welcome back to the Jersey Diner Showdown. If you're new around here, 
For starters, go check out part one. Don't worry, I'll wait. If you're new here, my husband and I are visiting every county in the state to visit their top diner to determine what the best diner in the diner capital of the world actually is. In our last episode, we crowned Cumberland County's own Maurice River Diner as the champion of the South Division. And in this one, we will be taking on my home region, Central. For the purposes of this competition, Central New Jersey consists of five counties, Mercer, Hunterdon, Somerset, Middlesex, and Union. As a quick recap, diners have been selected based on review scores, word of mouth recommendations, local notoriety, and the blessing of Guy Fieri and diners, drive-ins, and dives. Each diner will be scored out of five in four categories, food, ambiance, cost, and bonus. The diner with the highest score in this division will go on to the final four to see who will become the best diner in New Jersey. Since we currently live in Central Jersey, it made more sense to space these visits out over a couple of days rather than a full-fledged weekend road trip. It was better for our gas mileage and our sanity, which would come into question later. With that being said, let's take our first visit to this trip to Somerset County's own Time to Eat Diner. Our first stop takes us to Somerset County and the Time to Eat Diner in Bridgewater. I grew up very locally, so going here was like a homecoming. I spent many late nights here in high school and college, sharing a plate of disco fries and being wistful in the way only a suburban kid at 2 a.m. can. It was exceptionally busy for a Friday night, but we were seated promptly. I was actually nervous to take much footage because of how busy it was, but when we were seated, the familiar menu held a few surprises. Unlike the good majority of Jersey diners, this one has a significant Polish section, as opposed to the traditional Greek. Visually, the diner has a lot of wood paneling on the interior, which made me feel like I was kind of on a boat. Michael ordered pigs in a blanket, the breakfast version, and I ordered the dinner special Cuban panini, which came with a bowl of seafood bisque soup. This soup alone is the reason I wanted to come on a Friday, and it did not disappoint. This was our first stop on the whole diner showdown endeavor, and it felt like we were off to a very good start. Good stuff. I love this soup, so much so that years ago I bought an entire quart of it to take home. It is truly delicious. When our entrees arrived, Michael's pigs in a blanket were pretty good. Normal breakfast sausage and fluffy pancakes, no complaints. However, my Cuban sandwich was so flavorless I had to have Michael try it and confirm because I legitimately thought I may have developed COVID in the interim. It tasted like nothing. The pork was juicy, but it lacked any variety. I'm going. Ooh, that's a long pull. Cheese pull. Very guy thing. Yeah. Pretty good. All right, cool. What they lacked in entree, though, was made up for in dessert. We got a slice of cannoli cheesecake, which was rich, creamy, and decadent. Easily one of the best desserts we've had at this point. The pastry selection here is small, but mighty. I'm going there. Real good. <laughs> no Final scores. Food, three. Ambiance, three. Cost, four. Bonus three for a final score of 13 out of 20. Later that same weekend, we traveled to Middlesex County for our next stop. Multiple co-workers recommended the Skylife Diner in Edison, and partnered with this being a Triple D location, we knew it was a must. The Skylark has an incredible atmosphere, very atomic age, bright, cheery, and tons of neon, or at least LEDs emulating such. There was a troop of Girl Scouts selling cookies in the foyer, which is always a good sign for me, and of course I bought a box. The Skylark is one of the first in a series I'm calling Diner in Name Only. It's definitely an elevated sort of eating establishment, more than a bit bougie with a cocktail menu and reduced food menu. The menu itself is seasonally rotated, a bit limited, but the dishes on offer sounded incredible. I got an order of chorizo biscuits and gravy, served with sunny side up eggs and Carolina grits, which had ham and cheese inside. Michael had a French dip with fries. My biscuits and gravy were one of the most delicious meals I've ever had, which made South Jersey's disappointment from the last episode hurt even more. 
The biscuits were fluffy, the gravy was seasoned beautifully, and the slight spice from the chorizo didn't overpower anything. Eggs were eggs. The grits were just a bit unusual. I think if they had been made with country ham instead of just regular ham, they'd have been a lot better, but they were definitely unique. All right, filming now. Real good. Michael's sandwich was very good, too. The jus was seasoned nicely, the roast beef wasn't dry, but the fries were nothing to write home about. We also pivoted slightly with this one. All of the desserts were best served in person, so we ordered the Brookie skillet with vanilla ice cream. It was rich, decadent, and absolutely delicious. Now for the elephant in the room. We were seated after about 15 minutes, but waited quite some time for just about everything. Normally, I don't let service affect scores much, but the diner was pretty dead for a Sunday afternoon with no football. We had to flag down a completely different server in order to be able to get silverware after we'd gotten our food. All total, we were there for nearly three hours, which is a little much. I don't know the reasoning, but it was kind of a huge bummer. Also, with bouginess comes upcharge, and this was one of the most expensive diners we've been to thus yet. Final score. Food, five. Ambiance, three. Cost, two. Bonus, 2.5 for a final score of 13.5 out of 20. A week later, the third stop on our Central Jersey tour was Union County's Bayway Diner, or more specifically, Johnny Prince's famous Bayway Diner. The Bayway is truly famous in so much that it appeared on the very first episode of Diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives as the very first diner ever featured. The Bayway is an exception to some of our rules. For one, it's more of a luncheonette than a full diner and closes at 3 p.m. on most days. However, for star power alone, we knew it was worth it, and boy would we be proven correct. The Bayway is an old dining car style diner with eight single counter seats, though they do offer outdoor seating. You can see the griddle behind the counter, and it is cramped but cozy and inviting. There was a tiny TV playing those weird shows they play instead of Saturday morning cartoons on our visit, and the wait staff were super friendly and welcoming. Though the menu was seemingly small, there was a large selection of breakfast, lunch, and dinner favorites. The diner opens at 5 a.m. every weekday to serve the workers at the local tank farm, and having been to that very tank farm for work, I know this place is well loved. Our server suggested I try the cream of broccoli soup, which I did with a grilled cheese and bacon sandwich on Texas toast. Michael got pork roll and cheese on a... Michael got a pork roll and cheese sandwich with potato. For starters, if they have the soup on offer when you go, get it. It was delicious, fresh, and creamy. Not a hint of can to be found. Grilled cheese was a sleeper hit too, simultaneously crispy and gooey, and the bacon was cooked perfectly. Michael's sandwich actually came with the breakfast potatoes on it, which was a surprising but welcome addition, and just pushed it over the edge to excellence. Do you have any of your sandwich? I will. On top of that, it was barely $20 for us to get food. An icon, truly. Dessert was a slice of iced lemon pound cake, which was moist and delicious. Barely a miss. Our server suggested that next time we come back, we should try the burgers. And boy, I hope there's a next time on this one. Final score. Food, 4.5. Ambiance, 4. Cost, 5. Bonus, 4. For a total score of 17.5 out of 20. The very next day, we headed out to Hunterdon County. Now, many of you might be thinking that we'd be hitting up the infamous Clinton Station Diner, one of the sole remaining 24-hour joints, and known for its over-the-top billboards advertising the ham bigger. But after reading numerous reports of overpiled trash cans, mediocre food, and less than sanitary conditions, we decided instead to visit another classic, at least in my mind, the Spinning Wheel Diner in Lebanon, New Jersey. This diner has a very diner feel to it, extremely chromed out, high ceilings in the vestibule, and multiple dining sections. The spinning wheel opened in 1987, and the local competition has come and gone, it has stayed the test of time. Though it was a Sunday morning, we were seated promptly, but I definitely felt this guy judging me every time I attempted to film anything. It was Michael's turn for lunch, so he ordered twin chili dogs with a bowl of matzo ball soup. 
For my breakfast, I got a diner standard. Two eggs sunny side up with toast, sausage, and home fries. The real winner here were the chili dogs. Two all beef hot dogs, plenty of beans in the chili, and the spice level was perfect. The fries were good and crisp, and the soup was good, but unremarkable. <laughs> I can't believe you're fork and knifing your hot dog. I don't see any other way to go. <clears throat> Looks good though. Nice. My eggs were spot on, toast even more so, and the home fries were crisp and tasty. Sausage was seasoned well, but not overly salty. There's your egg. You can cut and choose this as you want. Eh, you're gonna have to work on that. Ah, there you go. The reason I get egg. Yeah. All right. Prices were very reasonable considering the portions. A sort of panic ordered dessert and the plain cheesecake was just fine. Nothing to really write home about, but good enough. Mm. It's all right. It's nice creamy cheesecake. Final score. Food, 3.5. Ambiance, 3. Cost, 4. Bonus, 2.5. For a grand total of 13 out of 20. With a trip to South Jersey in between, we hit up our final establishment, Mercer County's Heightstown Diner, after work one day, since Michael's day job isn't too terribly far. Heightstown is our third Triple D location in this episode, appearing in the same episode as the Skylark. I remember seeing the Skylark, but I have no recollection of seeing the Heightstown. Weird. The diner is an extended dining car style with booths and counter seats and an extended dining area around the corner. It was dolled up to the nines for Valentine's Day, which was nice, but otherwise felt pretty standard. The Heightstown is apparently known for its corned beef hash, but neither of us liked that, so we passed. The menu was substantial with some adventurous options and impressive holiday specials. The diner wasn't super busy, but the clientele and staff alike were very friendly. Michael ordered the Godfather sandwich, which was breaded chicken, bacon, mozzarella cheese, and vodka sauce with fries and a cup of matzo ball soup. I got another standard breakfast of sunny side up eggs with toast, home fries, pork roll, and a side of grits. Keep in mind that there were like two to three weeks between visiting the spinning wheel and the Heights town for science. Michael's sandwich was the real showstopper here. The chicken was diced very saucy. It was served in a torpedo roll, crusty on the outside and soft on the inside, and very durable. It's mm. good. Fries were average, and the soup desperately needed salt. My eggy breakfast was pretty good. Eggs were fine. Home fries needed salt, and the grits, you guessed it, they needed salt too. They were, however, very creamy, which was very nice. All right. Well, I wasn't sure what action shot to get. <laughs> okay. Good potatoes. All right. All right. Let me get that toast in that egg there. Not on the potato. Because you're very hungry. Yes. The action shot. Yeah, toast to this. Mm. All right. Pretty good. For dessert, we took a piece of tres leches cake home to go, which was moist, flavorful, and perfectly sweet. Mmm. Ooh. That's nice. Let's see. Just a goop. That's really good. That's really mm. good. Wow, good job. That might be one of the better desserts we've gotten. It absolutely is. Mm. Yummy. It was a nice change of pace from the pretty standard diner desserts we'd been seeing, too. Price was more than reasonable. Final score? Food, 3. Ambiance, 3.5. Cost, 4. Bonus four for a total of 14.5 out of 20. And now the final tallies. A time to eat diner, 13 out of 20. A Skylark diner, 13.5 out of 20. The Bayway diner, 17.5 out of 20. 
The Spinning Wheel Diner, 13 out of 20. And the Heights Town Diner, 14.5 out of 20. Our winner is the Bayway Diner. And with that, our Central Jersey champions are Johnny Prince's famous Bayway Diner. It joins the Maurice River Diner in one of our final four diner slots. Stay tuned for the next episode where we take a marathon seven diner weekend trip to determine what is the best diner in all of North Jersey. In this episode, we take on a marathon weekend of seven diners. What surprises do we have in store? How many malls do we visit in between? Stay tuned. Hey everyone, I'm Elise Explosion and welcome back to the Jersey Diner Showdown. If you're new around here and you wanna check out the first two parts, South Jersey and Central Jersey, I'll wait for you to get back. You can check those up there. North Jersey turned out to be the most daunting of tasks with a grand total of seven diners to do in one weekend. It was easily one of the most exhausting trips we've ever taken, but it was well worth it. As always, every diner is ranked out of 20 in the categories of food, ambiance, cost, and bonus. Diners were chosen based on local reputation, online review scores, and whether or not Guy Fieri had ever been there. With that being said, let's head up Friday after work to our first stop, the Washington Diner. Our first stop on this most ambitious weekend takes us to Washington. No, not that Washington or that Washington, but that Washington in Warren County and the eponymous Washington Diner. We arrived Friday after work and were seated right away. The chrome of the diner was a real standout and the interior was friendly and inviting. The menu wasn't massive, but had a good selection of standards and interesting options. Michael ordered chicken and waffles and I ordered the macaroni and cheese. Since it was a Friday night during Lent in New Jersey, there were ample meatless and seafood options and the macaroni and cheese jumped right off the page at me. It came with a salad that had no right being as good as it was. I fully joined the clean plate club on this one and a cup of chicken rice soup, which Michael quite enjoyed. The mac and cheese was creamy and flavorful and though the pasta was slightly overcooked, it didn't deter from the overall experience. Michael's waffle was very tasty, light and fluffy, but the fried chicken ended up being a pretty generic chicken tenders. You syrup up your chicken? Uh, I don't know. I was thinking about it. Do people usually do that? I have no idea. I don't remember. One minute of Michael with chicken and syrup. Yeah. Figure out my processes. <laughs> Waffle and <coughs> chicken on it for some reason. <laughs> Derp. That's a nice fluffy waffle. Nice. Mm. Look at that. That's a big, beautiful this bowl. This is a lot of macaroni and cheese. Mix it up. Smells good. It looks cheesy. Look at that. Yeah, it does. All right. Hot. <laughs> Oops. Mm. That's got a nice little tank to it. All right. Good, good. <laughs> For dessert, we ordered a slice of Ferrero Rocher cake, which was fudgy, nutty, and absolutely delicious. Ooh, cake time. Fancy cake. It looks good. Yeah, it does. Ferrero cake. Ooh, crunchy bit. Mm. Ooh, crunchy bits. Oh, yeah. Mm, it's good. All right. Cool. <laughs> Ooh, crunchy bit. Yeah. Mmm. <laughs> That is so fudgy. It is fudgy good cake. Mm. That's really nice. We were off to a fabulous start and I certainly wouldn't mind making a return appearance here. Final scores, food, four. Ambiance, four. Cost, 4.5. Bonus, 4.5. For a final score of 17 out of 20. We headed home to sleep off our dinner and prepare ourselves for a full day of meals. Our first stop was the furthest northwest, Sussex County's Victoria Diner in Branchville, New Jersey. 
Branchville was a bit over an hour away, so we left fairly early in the morning. When we got to the Victoria, I was absolutely charmed by its appearance. It was super cute and colorful, a diner car style location with a very diverse menu. This location appeared on several best of lists, so we were chagrined to learn it was basically more of a luncheonette and closed at three in the afternoon. Michael ordered the bistro chicken panini and chips, and I decided to step a little out of my comfort zone and order the stuffed French toast with mixed berries. I admittedly do not like fresh berries much, but I was fascinated by the concept of this French toast and could not let it go. The berries were extremely tart, but Michael said I was being silly and they were perfectly sweet. Michael's panini was very pleasant. The spinach and peppers added some moisture to the sandwich, but the chicken was relatively unseasoned. Ooh, drippy. That looks nice. Juicy. Yeah, that's really juicy. There you go. Cream cheese in there. Center. Ooh. <laughs> you didn't get the stuffed part. No, I didn't. Stuffing is on the other side. Let me go over here. Shift. Shift. Oh, there, we go. A little bit. there you go. That's incredibly fluffy French toast. Mm -hmm. However, the bread was a big win. The biggest disappointment of all was that the waitress informed us they do not offer desserts, so we couldn't even take one to go. It was a cute little spot, but not one I could really call that much of a diner. Final scores, food, four. Ambiance, four. Cost, 3.5. Bonus, one. For a final score of 12.5 out of 20. With ample time to kill before our next stop, we made a side trip out to our first of many North Jersey malls. I went to college in North Jersey and I spent my fair share of time at the Garden State Plaza. Michael needed a watch battery change, so we wandered around and took a look at as many different Squishmallows as I could find. It was also a big Pokemon Go weekend, so unfortunately a lot of my time at the mall was spent raiding instead of filming. From there, our next stop was Hudson County's extremely popular Topps Diner. The Topps opened in 1942 and has widely been regarded by many to be the definitive Jersey Diner. A co-worker had mentioned that we may need reservations, but we assumed that since we were visiting at 2 p.m. on a Saturday, we'd be fine. <laughs> Alas, you know what they say about when you assume, and we did indeed make an ass out of you and me, as we were told there was a 75 minute wait for a table. Preparing for the worst, we put our names in at the podium and went back out to the car to sit and wait as the lobby was standing room only. After about 30 minutes, we got a text and were told that there were two seats at the counter, so we took them. The first strange thing was that the counter was not your typical diner counter, but rather a full service bar. The second strange thing was that we were seated right next to a live DJ. I found the music pretty fun, but Michael was decidedly not a fan. I cannot understate how packed this place was. There was a line nearly out the door the entire time we were inside, and I don't think I saw a single empty table. It had a very chic aesthetic to it, a cross between a nightclub and a library. It was Michael's turn for breakfast, and he ordered the banana pudding waffles with a cold brew coffee, and I ordered a bacon cheeseburger with fries. Michael's waffle was a real standout. The waffle itself was lovely, with fresh bananas and a quality pudding on top. The whipped cream was definitely house-made. Really good. Good. My burger was genuinely incredible. The bacon was thick cut and delicious, the patties were shaped and cooked perfectly to my specifications, and the fries were quite tasty. The pickle was also great. A little heat, a little sour, and a lot of delicious. Go, 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 yeah, up, oh, big burger. Ah. Oh my goodness, that's tough to handle. Real good? All right. We picked the rice pudding for dessert, allegedly the original 1942 recipe. It was fine. Nothing special, and the rice was a little undercooked. Very underwhelming, considering the rest of the food we'd had. Here's the rub, though. I need y'all to know that my burger was nearly $25. Yes, $25 for a burger. This is the bougiest place we have eaten this entire time. As Michael put it, this makes the Skylark look like a McDonald's play place. 
They fancied themselves quite upscale and their prices reflect in it. Our total bill came to nearly $80 for lunch. On the other hand, the food was absolutely some of the best that we'd had up to this point. It was a real conundrum, but we determined ultimately that this was another dino. Diner in name only. Final score. Food, 5. Ambiance, 3. Cost, 2.5. Bonus, 3. For a total score of 13.5 out of 20. Reeling from the prices, but not quite ready to eat just yet. We decided to continue our secondary quest for the weekend and hit up another mall, this time the Willowbrook Mall in Wayne. Willowbrook was another sort of homecoming for me. Willowbrook was the mall I'd visit the most when I was in college, and I spent many a Wednesday afternoon at the arcade playing DDR and grabbing a Wetzel pretzel for a power snack. The mall itself is relatively unchanged, though the arcade is long gone and instead replaced with the Dave and Busters we daren't entertain. Still, there's something about malls in New Jersey that just go together like bacon and eggs. And to continue the metaphor, diners are like the pancakes that complete your balanced breakfast. It just felt right. The next and final stop on our Saturday journey brought us to Morris County and the Pompton Queen Diner of Pompton Plains. The Pompton Queen had one of the highest review to rating ratios I'd seen, so my hopes were pretty high. For the second time that day, however, we ended up needing to wait for a table. There is a 30 minute wait for here. <laughs> so. We are going back to the car. Yes, let's go. We sat in the car for about half an hour, then were called inside to the table. The Pompton Queen opened in 1987, and like many of the diners on our list, was once in 24-hour operation, but is no longer. They had a significant in-house bakery case and a truly intimidating menu. The exterior definitely had a very late 80s, early 90s feel to it, and the interior wasn't particularly classic, but was very reminiscent of the diners of my youth. The nostalgia was definitely there. I was still fairly full from the giant burger I'd had for lunch and opted for a breakfast entree of the crepe de la creme, a sweet cream crepe served with vanilla ice cream on the side, and Michael opted for a grilled cheese and bacon with the house-made potato chips. Friends, we were so pleasantly surprised by this offering. Michael's sandwich was full of bacon, and the house-made chips were just the right combination of crunchy and chewy. Start eating the Eat it again. Eat more. That sandwich looks good. Good? Real good. My crepes, though. Holy b these were unbelievably tasty. Good ice cream, okay. Get into that crepe there. <laughs> you got it. All right. Oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God. <laughs> Well, you got it. Good job, huh? Good? Oh, man. The crepe batter was delightfully thin, the filling was sweet but tangy, and the ice cream added an additional sweet punch. The menu had said that the Pompton Queen was famous for their baklava cheesecake, and so we brought a slice of that back with us, and wow, just wow. This is by far the best dessert we've had. Hey. All right, so for starters, half of this... Is baklava. <laughs> Half of this is cheesecake. That's crazy. Um, all of this smells incredible for the record. So here we go. Oh boy. Yeah, right from the middle. Got a little bit of everything. There you go. Oh. Wow. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> what a reaction. This is the best dessert we've gotten yet. Oh, man. Okay. You are not prepared. Okay. Get both sides here. Oh, wow. You feel that? Yeah, I felt that baklava. Oh, and the creamy cheesecake. Yeah, it's so creamy. Wow. I told you! That is so good. That is Ooh. unreal delicious. Wow. The baklava had a lovely nutty honey flavor, and the cheesecake was light and not overly sweet, balancing the honey beautifully. 
easily a five star dessert. Final score, food, 4.5. Ambiance, four. Cost, four. Bonus, five. For a total of 17.5 out of 20. Sorry, Washington Diner, you put up a great fight. We drove home that night happy and full, ready for another day of diner adventures the next morning. The next day, we woke up and headed up north to Bergen County on our fifth diner, the Saddlebrook Diner in, you guessed it, Saddlebrook. The Saddlebrook Diner allegedly opened in the early 1950s and has been family owned since 1982. The diner itself is an ostentatious sort of visual, truly leaning into the 50s diner aesthetic, with lots of neon, oldies music in the background, a life-size Betty Boop statue, murals of 50s icons like James Dean and Marilyn Monroe, and a train set? Sure, why not? This place was almost a caricature of itself. It laid it on real thick. Despite the busy Sunday morning crowd, we were seated immediately. The menu was substantial and also looked really cool. Like I said, they're laying the aesthetics on hella strong here. Michael ordered a turkey pita pocket with fries, and I, using the language of the area, ordered a Taylor ham, egg white, and cheese on a hard roll with home fries. My sandwich was pretty good. The roll was good, and the egg whites were nice and fluffy. Michael's pita pocket was a truly interesting turn on a turkey club. The turkey was definitely roasted in-house, seasoned well, and the bacon was nice and thick. The pita was also a winner with a very good chew. So fresh. Look at how well packed it is. Oh wow. Is there sauce on that? Like a mayo or something? No, but it's cheese on both sides. Oh, okay. Mm. Fry. That is really nice. Fry. Oh, I have to consume a fry as well? Yes, consume a fry. I heard the crunch. It's an excellent diner. Your giant pile of fluffy potatoes. Mm. Salt, but good. Well, I mean, have you ever met a home fry you didn't think needed salt? Yes. I don't believe that's true. Yeah, that is very fluffy. It might be the fluffiest egg white I've ever seen. That's quite an accomplishment. How's it compare as Taylor Ham? <laughs> for dessert, Michael made the executive decision for the Snickers cake, which was fantastic. It was like a cross between a cheesecake and a chocolate cake with a layer of peanut butter on top. Excellent. The meal was a little on the pricier side, but a solid diner altogether. Final score, food, four. Ambiance, four. Cost, 3.5. Bonus, 4.5. For a total of 16 out of 20. Between diners, we took yet another detour, but this time in a much more decidedly natural way. Our travels took us to the Great Falls of Patterson, a United States National Historical Park. We brought our National Parks book with us and we were able to get our first stamp in a couple years. The Great Falls are literally smack dab in the middle of Patterson and are genuinely as majestic as they appear. This was my first time visiting the falls up close and despite it being a somewhat chilly winter day, look at the ice on the grass, we had a great time. It's a beacon of peace among the chaos of Patterson and I'm glad we were able to spend some downtime just watching the falls and catching rainbows in the mist. Our next stop afterwards was the Parkwood Diner in Maplewood, the Essex County option. The Parkwood was another local newspaper pick, but honestly it left a bit to be desired. The diner felt pretty dated, but not in a cute or kitschy way, just old. Parking was very tight. The menu itself was massive. They had a whole page of salads after all, and I was struggling by this point. Seven diners in one weekend is an awful lot, and I needed a vegetable, bad. I ordered the Popeye salad, spinach with prosciutto, fresh mozzarella, bacon, and balsamic vinaigrette with crispy chicken on top. And Michael got the French toast with caramelized apples and walnuts. I feel like we waited a long time for our food, but honestly, by this point, time had no meaning, so I'm not entirely sure. When the food arrived, Michael's French toast was the true winner here. Super creamy, flavorful, and the apples were tart and sweet. I was less impressed with my salad. There was a ton of prosciutto and bacon, but why both? We're gonna take it easy Okay. Thank <laughs> you. 
You gonna get a piece of chicken too? Or is it too hot? <laughs> What's up? That's the really? And worst of all, though my crispy chicken was both crispy and juicy, there was absolutely zero flavor or seasoning to it. Like someone could have deep fried a sponge to the same effect. That's a little harsh, but it felt about right. Dessert was carrot cake, which was dry and disappointing. All right, we have this giant slice of carrot cake right now. You're going to have to edit in all like the names of the diners because I've forgotten them all. Oh, yeah, no, I, I <laughs> Okay. Eh? It's just okay. It's a little dry. Oh no! Okay. Move a little icing over. Get a little in. Also, there are raisins in it. Oh no, there are? Mm hmm. Ah, you're right. There is a raisin right there. It's pretty good. Obviously, at least can't eat it. <laughs> not my favorite, not by far. Also, my salad was nearly $20, which I truly did not understand. Final score, food, 3.5. Ambiance, 3. Cost, 3. Bonus, 2.5 for a final score of 12 out of 20. There wasn't a huge drive between the Parkwood and our final diner, so we decided to detour one last time to one last mall, and we figured we would make it a hat trick with a big one. American Dream, the monster of the Meadowlands, potentially Jimmy Hoffa's final resting place. A financial disaster through and through, but yet you cannot resist the appeal of the second largest mall in the United States. It was absolutely slammed for a Sunday, and weirdly enough, though it rests in Bergen County, not all the stores were closed. This is unusual mostly for the fact that Bergen County still has blue laws, and though the American Dream website says that it applies to some stores, it does not apply to all. So like, most clothing stores were a no-go, but Toys R Us? Hell yeah. Turns out that there's a loophole, as always, where if stores are listed as a novelty, they're allowed to remain open. So I bought a Squishmallow about it, and Dina is the best, and we love her. As we steeled ourselves for the final diner, I tried to process the whole weekend. This was a lot all at once. I wish we'd pace things a bit better, but between family emergencies and arbitrary deadlines, we were running out of time. Channel your inner guy, Elise. You got this. Our final stop on the North Jersey endeavor was Passaic County's Allwood Diner. We'd originally planned on visiting the TikTok of Triple D fame, but reviews from both family and the internet seemed to agree that since the 2020 shutdowns, it has been a shell of its former self. The Allwood, however, fit into the same niche as the Willowbrook Mall, a true nostalgic favorite. I lived in the apartment complex across the street when I was in grad school and would often walk here for a late night snack. I remember it with quite a bit of affection since it opened up while I was living there. Would it hold up? Well, let's find out. To a much smaller scale, they were playing club music when we got in, not unlike the tops, but also very unlike the tops. Our server was great, very friendly with a lot of North Jersey sass. The menu was ample and I was having a real hard time making choices by this point. I decided that my best course of action was to fall back on the diner snacks that I grew to love over my time in college and ordered the appetizer sampler of chicken fingers, buffalo wings, mozzarella sticks, and potato skins. Michael's final breakfast of the trip culminated in an order of silver dollar pancakes with sausage in an attempt to make his own pigs in a blanket. The pancakes were fluffy and like they literally gave him 12 whole little pancakes. The sausage was good, but cooked a little over. As for the appetizer sampler, the wings were crispy and juicy, but had no flavor or spice to them at all. The tendies were pretty standard. Mozzarella sticks were cooked well, but again, somewhat lacking in flavor. But the potato skins were truly loaded with bacon and a good amount of cheese. Easily the best thing on the plate. There's a pig in a blanket taco. <laughs> look at that. Oh, those look super fluffy. Yeah, those are really good. Nice. This guy's an avocado. Mm, good. Mozzarella stick, dip it in the sauce. There you go. Ooh, you were so fast with that. I barely got you. <laughs> Thank you. 
Is it mozzarella stick? Can we have another fork in Sounds reasonable. For dessert, I played my executive decision card and got a slice of birthday cake cheesecake, which was admittedly a little disappointing. The sprinkles in the cake batter turned into little wax pellets, and the cake at the bottom was just kind of spongy. Not great, but not the worst either. Final score, food, 3.5. Ambiance, three. Cost, three. Bonus, 3.5 for a final score of 13 out of 20. Not even nostalgia could save this one. After our marathon weekend, the final scores were as follows. Washington, 17 out of 20. Victoria, 12.5 out of 20. Tops, 13.5 out of 20. Pompton Queen, 17.5 out of 20. Saddlebrook, 16 out of 20. Parkwood, 12 out of 20. Allwood, 13 out of 20. By half a point, the winner of the North Division is the Pompton Queen. Congratulations to the Pompton Queen Diner. You join the Maurice River Diner and the Bayway Diner in our final four. We have one more diner left to find, and that will be from the Jersey Shore region. Stay tuned for the next episode to see how many diners we have left to go and who will take the crown in the Jersey Shore region. Thanks so much, everyone, and we'll see you next time. In this episode, we love to be by the seaside as we continue the search for the best diners and roadside stops at the Jersey Shore. Hi, everyone. I'm Elise Explosion, and welcome back to the Jersey Diner Challenge. When we last left our heroes, we had just tackled seven diners in one weekend for the North Jersey Challenge. This time, we're taking it a little easier and taking on the four diners of the Jersey Shore region, Monmouth, Ocean, Atlantic, and Cape May counties. If you're new around here, you can check out the previous videos in the series right here. But for a quick recap, we divided the state into four regions, North, Central, South, and Shore. One diner from each county was selected based on local notoriety, word of mouth, Guy Fieri appearances, and online review scores. Each diner is scored out of 20, with up to five points being given for food, ambiance, cost, and bonus, which is a combination of dessert, service, or anything else that we just can't fit into any other category. On that note, let's get this rainy trip started with our first stop, the Blue Swan Diner. The Blue Swan is absolutely a sentimental favorite for us. I lived in Monmouth County for 10 years, having only recently moved away, and this was one of the last restaurants we visited before we left. I have always had an affinity for their unique breakfasts, but have had some difficulty in the past with strange choices made for their more savory lunch and dinner options. Why would you season my chicken cheesesteak with Italian seasoning? Regardless, despite the absolutely miserable weather, it was good to see. The Blue Swan isn't the most aesthetically pleasing of all diners, but it is friendly and cozy. It's a cross between a more neon style and a Mediterranean style. And one thing I've realized since starting this endeavor is that the more Mediterranean style diners just do not visually appeal to me at all. After being seated, Michael ordered a tuna melt with fries and I ordered my beloved angel pancakes, which the menu describes as such. Our signature pancakes filled with creamy farina custard topped with crispy phyllo dough, powdered sugar, and cinnamon served with our homemade lemon zest syrup. I admit my bias on this. It is my absolute favorite, and I am definitely inclined to like this. And as expected, I did. It is so unique and interesting. The farina custard is totally unlike anything I've ever had in a breakfast, and the crispy phyllo is a fun addition. I wasn't feeling the lemon syrup today, so thankfully our server brought me regular pancake syrup, too. Been a while. It has been a very long time. Make sure you get all the custard. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, Michael's tuna melt was a total bust. It wasn't dry, but there definitely wasn't enough mayo, and it was very bland. You gotta. Yeah, it's rather large. That is significant. Mm -hmm. yeah, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Just okay? Yeah. For dessert, the menu mentioned that their cheesecake was famous, so we had to go with that. It had a really soft and fluffy texture, but with almost no tang to it. It was quite nice and definitely one of the more unique cheesecake offerings we'd gotten. Oh. Yes, it does look well. I don't know if that's good or bad. But we'll find out. Mmm. It's a good and creamy cheesecake. 
Ooh. Mm. There we are. Ooh. That's right. soft. Yeah, that's what I was like. Nice big piece. Ooh. Yeah. That's nice. Mm. It's not tangy. No. Hmm. That's pretty good. Final scores. Food, 3.5. Ambiance, 3.5. Cost, 3. Bonus, 4. For a total of 14 out of 20. We decided to brave the elements once more on our way to the next roadside stop, Jenkinson's Aquarium in Point Pleasant, New Jersey. No Mothman in this Point Pleasant, just a lovely little boardwalk with an extremely cute aquarium. Jenks has long been a favorite of mine since I was a little kid, opening in 1991. I was bereft to learn that their longtime resident, Lucille the Harbor Seal, passed away late last year, but I'd learned that they had welcomed a new rescue, Baby Turbo. Turbo had a flipper amputated after sustaining an infection and was deemed unsafe to return to the wild. The first thing I noticed was that they'd recently done some refurbishments, and the next thing I noticed were the sharks and rays. This was always one of my favorite exhibits, and I can spend a ton of time just staring at them. But then... We rounded the corner, and there she was. Turbo, the baby of the world. Just look at her. Look at her! She is so sweet and playful, and I love her already. Her tank mate Nolani was rescued from the same rehab facility in 2018, and they're just such a good match. I digress. There were penguins and fish and horseshoe crabs and turbo and sloths and sharks and turbo and hang on, are those axolotls? I spent like 10 minutes just looking at these little guys. You know how I am about them. I am so about those that I bought a little guy in the gift shop and he kept us company for the rest of the trip. We loaded up and headed down to our motel, which smelled strongly of cigarette smoke, but had the most comfortable bed I'd ever slept in and waited a bit until it was time for dinner and our next stop. It was a fairly short drive down to Atlantic County and Hamilton Silver Coin Diner. We had originally hoped to visit Mustache Bills in Barnegat, but sadly the restaurant closed this past winter after 52 years in operation. The silver coin? Wow. This was quite possibly the flashiest, most neon, most chrome diner we visited. The menu was substantial and had a lot of very interesting options. We were seated and the first thing we noticed was this adorable little blueberry mural in the middle of the dining room ceiling. Very cute. Hamilton is known for their blueberries and at one point New Jersey produced the third most blueberries in the entire United States so it made sense to pay tribute to them. As such, Michael ordered a blueberry waffle with pork roll and I ordered the special chicken Alfredo pasta with a side salad. We also ordered an appetizer that did not count towards the score, but I will say that their mac and cheese bites was definitely just deep fried Kraft Mac. My salad was nice and refreshing and Michael's waffle had a nice vanilla flavor with fresh sweet berries. Yum. Good. My pasta, though, was another story. It desperately needed salt or cheese or something more savory involved. It just tasted like plain cream. Good piece of the chicken in there, too. Yeah. Ah, uh, okay. Wow. The most disappointing part was the sheer overpowering raw garlic taste. The garlic had the same texture as the peas, and biting down on them when you didn't know what was what was really unpleasant. Don't get me wrong, I love garlic, and a lot of garlic, but this was just not the way. On top of that, when Michael ate my leftovers the following Monday, he got sick. On top of that, I had made a silly comment when we were paying at the register about needing a mint due to all the garlic, and the man taking our money was so incensed that he felt the need to defend all of the raw garlic, saying that some dishes just need it that way. Sorry, man. Nah, th that's not how it works. For dessert, we got a peanut butter pie, which seemed to have all the tang the cheesecake from the blue swan didn't have. It was nice, but I think Michael seemed to enjoy it more than me. Final score. Food, 2.5. Ambiance, 4.5. Cost, 4. Bonus, 4 for a final score of 15 out of 20, which is frankly higher than I think it deserves, but that's the way the cookie crumbles. Or the garlic overpowers. We return to our hotel to rest, recuperate, play a little bit of remote Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, and avoid the cigarette smoke as best we could. The next morning we awoke to see that the storm had subsided and it was a lovely sunny day. The boys were back in town as we headed down to Dino's Seaville Diner, located in Seaville in Cape May County, and yes, I did have Thin Lizzy running through my head the entire time. Dino's is a fairly unassuming little diner with an extremely classic feel with modern touches. 
There were a lot of nods to Dino himself, who passed in 2008, but really felt like a cornerstone of the community. Reading on their website, they even have a charity in his name that gives money to local children requiring medical assistance. The man was well-loved, and it still comes through all these years later. Unfortunately, we seem to have gotten there a little too early for the all-day menu, so we both ordered from the breakfast menu. Michael got the crunchy French toast, which appeared to be coated with Captain Crunch cereal. Hoping for redemption yet again, I opted for the biscuits and gravy with a side of hash browns. Michael's French toast was easily the best breakfast either of us had had this entire trip. It was crunchy, creamy, and absolutely spectacular. All right, Michael is sauced up. Crunchy. Oh, that looks good. It's nice good. and fluffy. Yeah, it's crunchy, but still fluffy. That's good. Yeah. Definitely a new experience, <laughs> the crunch. <laughs> My biscuits and gravy were pretty classic, but amped up. The gravy was creamy, the biscuits were fluffy and rich, and the hash browns were super crispy. For starters, that's breakfast sausage. <laughs> a noted improvement. But noted. you do have to get the biscuit. Mmm. Good. All right. That's good. Our dessert was a slice of carrot cake, which I think might just be a mistake on my behalf, since I don't like raisins. It felt a little dry, but we also had to wait a full day to taste it, so we'll chalk that up to potential user error. Final score. Food, 4. Ambiance, 4. Cost, 4.5. Bonus, 3.5, for a total of 16 out of 20. The beautiful sunny day paved the way for our next stop, a trip to Margate and the one and only Lucy the Elephant. Lucy is the world's oldest roadside attraction, having been built in 1882. Lucy had recently been repainted and refurbished, and we bought tickets for the full tour. While we waited, we detoured straight to the ocean, which makes sense for a Jersey Shore tour. How could we do the shore region without seeing the water? Heresy. During the tour, I learned a lot about the history of Lucy herself. For one, she was never a hotel, though one summer she was rented out to an English doctor and his family as a summer home. In addition, after falling into disrepair by the 60s, a group of locals fundraised enough money to have her moved and refurbished, and she was transported over the course of seven hours, approximately two blocks away from her original location. Lucy is a true icon of the Jersey Shore, and I'm so happy we finally got to see the whole structure. We even got to stand on her palanquin and see the surrounding area and get some photos. It could not have been a more beautiful day. After our adventure with Lucy, we got stuck in a bit of traffic going northbound and slowly made our way to the Sandcastle Diner in Ocean County. The Sandcastle opened in 1988 and has been a landmark in the area. I mean, look, they even have a dinosaur. The diner itself is honestly pretty plain. The walls were all white and very clean and decorated with what seemed like local photography but it was definitely more sterile than anywhere else we'd been. Kind of rental apartment vibes. The menu was simple, but had a host of favorites. Michael ordered himself a pork roll sandwich, weirdly called Taylor Ham this far south, with hash browns, and I ordered buffalo chicken wrap with fries. Michael's breakfast sandwich was served on a nice soft roll, and the meat was grilled, though despite requests it was both served with egg and we were charged for that as well. The home fries were just okay. My buffalo chicken sandwich... Man, I seem to be striking out a lot with buffalo-flavored things on this trip. For starters, there was no buffalo or blue cheese taste. There you go. Good. Mm -hmm. Nice-looking hard roll. Mm -hmm. Cool. And it was basically just a couple chicken tenders and a tortilla. On top of that, it was so small that Michael asked if I got a children's portion. It tasted okay, but it didn't really match the description. When we went to order dessert, the waitress initially suggested that we order the cheesecake, which they bring in from a bakery up in North Jersey. This felt kind of contrary to the spirit of the trip, so we ordered a slice of fudgy chocolate cake. The cake was very fudgy, and it was pretty tasty, though I'm still not sure if they do any in-house baking or not. It was an interesting little place, but definitely not a showstopper. Final score. Food, three. Ambiance, three. Cost, three. Bonus, three. For a total of 12 out of 20. And now the total scores. Blue Swan Diner, 14 out of 20. Silver Coin Diner, 15 out of 20. 
Dino's Seville Diner, 16 out of 20. Sandcastle Diner, 12 out of 20. With a total score of 16 out of 20, the winner of the Shore Division is Dino's Seville Diner. Congratulations to Dino's. It joins the Maurice River Diner, Johnny Prince's famous Bayway Diner, and the Pompton Queen Diner in our final four. Join us next time as we revisit all four diners with some new metrics to crown the true champion best diner in New Jersey. We'll see you then. In this video, we revisit the final four to crown the true best diner in New Jersey. These diners have a tough act to follow themselves. Welcome back everyone. I'm Elise Explosion and this is the Jersey Diner Challenge. Back in January, my husband proposed that we attempt to find the best diner in the entire state of New Jersey. With over 500 in the state, we knew we had to narrow it down some based on a combination of local repute, online review scores, Guy Fieri appearances, and word of mouth. After narrowing it down to 21 diners, one from each county, we were left with four individual champions, one from each region. Representing North Jersey, it's Morris County's Pumpton Queen Diner. Representing Central Jersey, it's Union County's Johnny Prince's Famous Bayway Diner. Representing the Jersey Shore, it's Cape May County's Dino's Seaville Diner. And finally, representing South Jersey, it's Cumberland County's Maurice River Diner. To make things a little more interesting, we decided that we needed to change up the grading a little bit. For starters, food will now be weighted out of 10 points versus the original five. In addition, we will now be getting a shared starter or appetizer to add to the bonus. And most importantly, my sister, the legendary behind the scenes Karen, will now be joining us to grade on a very important diner staple, the humble cheeseburger. Since this was going to cover quite a bit of distance, we decided to split it up into two days with two diners each. First up were the south of the Driscoll offerings, starting with the Maurice River Diner. It was yet again a lovely sunny day as we made the nearly two hour trip down to Port Elizabeth. As we pulled up to the diner, it offered us a view that we totally missed out on during our last visit. The first thing we noticed is that the window art had been changed out since our last trip, swapping from wintry scenes to a lovely set of spring flowers. The diner was super busy for a Saturday afternoon, and it turns out they were hosting a handful of birthday parties in the banquet room. We were seated right away with the hum of women's soccer in the background on the television. For a starter, we ordered the macaroni and cheese bites. I ordered the Nutella French toast with sausage. Michael ordered the cordon bleu panini with chips, and Karen ordered a plain cheeseburger with fries. For dessert, we opted for the moose mouse. The mac and cheese bites were very clearly made in-house, which was a big plus, but we all decided that the flavor needed a bit more of a punch either a sharper cheese or a bit more salt. The marinara served with it was fine, but the buster cleared it from the table before we were all done using it. So that was a little weird. As for entrees, Karen's burger was cooked to temperature and loaded with cheese, but the cheese wasn't fully melted and the fries were a bit cold. The bun was wonderful though, nice and sturdy. Michael was a bit disappointed that these were not homemade potato chips, but rather a bag of Lay's with his panini, which we decided was a very clever riff on a cordon bleu using blue cheese. The ham was good and the chicken was flavorful, but the panini itself was a little underpressed and not very toasty. It's really good. Nice. Mm. My French toast had a good flavor with toasted walnuts on top and juicy sausage, but was ultimately kind of dry. I'm gonna need you to film that. Oh shit, damn Karen. Yeah, get as much of everything as you can. Big box? Yeah, I hope that's not my Oh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah go yeah, for yeah. it. Yeah, there is. Like, it's not Heinz ketchup. It's like, it's the, it's the regular price. Pretty good. Pretty good? Pretty good. The moose mouse was nice and chocolatey, tasty enough, but paled in comparison to some of the other desserts we'd had. Final score. Food, 7.5 out of 10. Ambiance, 4.5 out of 5. Cost, 4 out of 5. Bonus, 4 out of 5 for a total score of 20 out of 25. After our brunch, we decided to take another sunny day detour, this time to the very tip of New Jersey, Sunset Beach in Cape May. Sunset Beach is not a swimming beach, not really. 
There are a few touristy shops, but most important to me is the view of the wreck of the SS Atlantis. The SS Atlantis was one of 12 concrete ships built during World War I as part of the Emergency Fleet Corporation, reportedly used either to transport coal or servicemen, and I can't find a clear answer. After its retirement, it was brought to Cape May to serve as a ferry between it and Delaware, something the Cape May Lose Ferry does currently. However, tragedy struck in June of 1926 when a storm hit, unmooring the ship from its dock and running it aground. The ship was not able to be refloated, and so the wreck has stayed in place since then, submerging further and further into the ocean as the years roll on. The wreck at one time had a spray-painted billboard reminding people to get boat insurance on the side, but is now nothing more than a monument to time. It is fascinating and a true piece of weird New Jersey history. After sitting and watching the surf a bit, we also drove over to see the Cape May Lighthouse, amusingly located in Lower Township. Fun New Jersey fact! In Cape May County, there is an Upper Township, a Middle Township, and a Lower Township. Guess what order they lay in geographically. I digress. I love lighthouses, and Cape May has a special place in my heart for being the location where we completed the Lighthouse Challenge a few years back. But we had taken enough time and we were starting to get hungry again, so off we went, dressed to kill, back at Dino's Bar and... Uh, I mean, Dino's Seaville Diner our Jersey Shore winner. I have to admit, Dino's is much bigger than we originally suspected. Upon our last visit, I had only barely glanced at the dining room, which actually stretches all the way back and seats a goodly amount of additional guests. We ended up seated in the very back corner this time around. First things first, our server was absolutely wonderful, a true slice of Jersey herself, and she absolutely made the meal a thousand times better. This side of the dining room was a little more muted than the other and felt more like a banquet hall than a diner. It wasn't quite as appealing, which was kind of a letdown. However, the real stars were just getting ready. The food. Karen ordered the standard cheeseburger and fries. Michael's breakfast was the highly advertised red velvet waffle with pork roll, and I ordered a chicken burger with bacon and blue cheese with a side of fries. For our starter, we opted for a classic, mozzarella sticks. First up were the mozzarella sticks, which honestly blew my expectations out of the water. Look at this cheese pull! Extraordinary! They were battered and fried, served hot, and the piece de resistance, the marinara. I'm not a huge tomato sauce kind of person, but this was so cheesy and delicious, it really made the flavors pop. We all loved these. Karen's burger was cooked perfectly to temperature with a much better cheese melt. The patty was fresh, juicy, and hot, not mushy and greasy. The bun was a nice sweet brioche with a great texture. Fries were overall good. Michael's waffle was served with dollops of cream cheese frosting, which I found particularly appealing, though of course this was not my meal, but his. Oh, God, it looks like soft serve ice cream. Were good. The waffle was crispy and tasty, though unfortunately the edges were slightly over to slightly burnt, which did the whole dish a disservice. I guess the batter itself being a dark red made it a little easier to mask the doneness. My chicken burger stood out to me as the menu described the meat as ground in-house, which was definitely appealing. The flavor combination was great. There was a ton of blue cheese and bacon, and it worked really well with the ground chicken. The patty was a little dry, but between the cheese and mayonnaise, it really evened out. <laughs> for dessert, our server recommended the cannoli pie, and you didn't have to twist my arm for this one. I love cannoli, and this was a great combination, but very heavy and very dense. I'm glad we saved it for later in the day, because there would have been no way I could have eaten this immediately after my meal. Final score. Food, 8.5 out of 10. Ambiance, 3.5 out of 5. Cost, 4 out of 5. Bonus, 4.5 out of 5 for a total score of 20.5 out of 25. We returned home to rest and recuperate. Two diners down, two to go. The end is near. We can see the light at the end of the tunnel. But is it the end or is it an oncoming train? Only time will tell. One week later. The weather was truly against us on the final day of our diner tour. Heavy rains and the threat of flooding was in the air. Men ground. There was a lot of rain. But off we went to our first stop of the day the Central Jersey winner, Johnny Prince's famous Bayway Diner. The diner was packed when we arrived, but thankfully a handful of seats cleared out shortly after we got in. If the weather had been better, I'd planned to possibly eat at the picnic tables outside, but that wasn't plausible this go-around. I also lose some personal points here, as I had neglected to mention to Karen how cramped it would be, and it was not particularly accessible. This is not a place you would go as a large group, 
or with people that have mobility issues or small children. This is definitely a space intended for blue collar workers at the local factories and facilities. One of the really nice things though is the closeness you feel eating here. Your neighbors are right next to you. The guy sitting next to me was a roofer and the guy down the counter was driving through from New Hampshire down to Maryland, going to visit sick relatives and stopping at as many Triple D locations as he could along the way. The same lovely waitress was there from our first visit and most importantly, Johnny Prince himself. It felt like I had known these people my whole life talking shit and just hanging out like we were old friends. It was an extremely good vibe and one that is not easily replicated. Since the menu is a little limited, our starter this time around was a bowl of Italian wedding soup for Michael. Karen again fulfilled her role as cheeseburger judge with a separate side of fries. Michael got the blackjack chicken sandwich and I got the belly buster breakfast sandwich. The owner told Michael right off the bat that the blackjack was his favorite item on the menu, which was a breaded cutlet with a pile of bacon, pepper jack cheese, and chipotle ranch. The cutlet was thin and juicy, extremely tasty on great bread. Michael agreed, this is a truly top tier sandwich. The soup was also pretty good with lots of tiny meatballs and very tasty. The belly buster was a formidable breakfast sandwich. Pork roll, bacon, sausage, ham, American cheese, hash browns, and egg whites all on an incredible Italian bread. This was so intimidating, but so, so delicious. The most impressive though was Karen's burger. She said straight up that this was a perfect 10. She would not change a single thing about it. It was cooked a perfect medium well with a good amount of cheese and a beautiful seeded Kaiser roll. The fries were crinkle cut and poured straight out of the fry basket onto a plate and served to us. The meal at the Bayway is truly impressive with a genuinely reasonable price point. For dessert, we shared a slice of chocolate chocolate chip pound cake, which was lovely, but in my opinion, not as good as the iced lemon pound cake we had the last time. Its menu and hours are limited, but there is genuinely nothing like the Bayway. It's famous for a reason. Final score, food, 9.5 out of 10. Ambiance, three out of five. Cost, five out of five. Bonus, four out of five for a final score of 21.5 out of 25. On the road, we decided that our final roadside stop should be none other than a mall, mostly because it was raining. And so we ended up at one that I hadn't been to since my college years, the Rockaway Town Square Mall in Rockaway, New Jersey. The mall was totally different from the last time I'd visited. This incredible mural really stood out and it was light and bright and busy. The first thing I did was try out this extremely weird cotton candy vending machine, which kind of sort of made the design that I'd wanted. Either way, it was tasty and a nice little reprieve. We also found a couple of true gachapon machines, which threw me off guard. I got a very cute little Anya from Spy Family and Michael ended up getting a little guy from My Hero Academia. Can you tell I don't watch that show? Having thoroughly dried off, we headed back out in the elements to our final stop, the winner of our North Division, the Pompton Queen Diner. This, along with the Bayway, were our highest scoring diners of the first round, both getting a 17.5 out of 20. The Bayway had already made an extremely strong showing, but would the Pompton Queen be able to keep up? The short answer is yes. The long answer is hell yes. We were seated in the same area we were last time, but this time got a pretty close look at the paintings on the walls. To my surprise, they were all original artworks created specifically for the Pompton Queen. Additionally, as this was the final stop on our whirlwind diner tour, we decided to splurge and get milkshakes, which will not be factored into grading. They were, however, delicious. For our starter, we opted for the spinach and artichoke dip with tortilla chips. Karen ordered her final cheeseburger of the tour, Michael ordered chicken and waffles with peppercorn gravy, and I decided to go with a personal favorite, a French dip with queen chips. The spinach and artichoke dip started us off on an extremely high note. It was a very generous portion, enough for all three of us to share with tons of cheese, and perhaps most importantly, house-made tortilla chips fresh out of the fryer. What really pushed it over the edge though was the fact that it was so good, it inspired Karen and I to want to try and make it for ourselves to try and replicate it. Wow. Karen's cheeseburger, while not quite as good as the Bayways, was still an extremely high quality offering. The menu said that they grind their own meat, which was evident in how fresh the patty was. It was cooked to more of a true medium rather than a medium well, but the sear lines from being cooked on a grill were noticeable. Fries were a little sad, not quite cooked as nicely, but a sleeper hit was the mayo of all things. Karen felt it was a distinctly different brand, possibly Duke's, which we love, but is impossible to find here in New Jersey. And that really took it to a new level. Michael's chicken and waffles were in fact chicken tenders, but they were very nice seasoning on the chicken and the waffle was nice and fluffy and most importantly, not overcooked. The peppercorn gravy was great to dip, but it was also very nice to have the option of syrup and butter for the waffle versus an all savory affair. My French dip, 
Well, look at it. This is an ungodly amount of meat on one sandwich. There was a good amount of Swiss cheese as well as a lovely umami to the jus. This sandwich was already amazing, but then the queen chips, house-made potato chips, were great, just thick enough to still have a chew, but were also still crunchy and very flavorful. For dessert, as much as we loved the baklava cheesecake the first time, so much so that I took Slice home for later, we opted for the dulce de leche cake, effectively a trace leches cake with a bit of extra caramel. It was, of course, absolutely delicious, both light and fluffy and dense and sweet at the same time, a truly great combination of flavors and textures, and one I would absolutely eat again if you could pry me away from the baklava cheesecake. Final scores. Food, 9 out of 10. Ambiance, 4.5 out of 5. Cost, 4 out of 5. Bonus, 5 out of 5, for a total score of 22.5 out of 25. As we left the pumped and queen, it finally started to settle in the massive task we had undertaken, and having reached the end, it definitely felt more than a little bittersweet. This has probably been the most fun way I could think of to beat my seasonal depression, and gave us something fun and exciting to look forward to during the sad and gray winter. Before we reveal the winner, though, let's have some runners-up. These are all diners that didn't make it to the final four, but we still felt were worth acknowledging. In the We Got Robbed category, I would like to extend a true apology to Warren County's Washington Diner. With a score of 17 out of 20, it would have won nearly every other region, but it was half a point shy of taking out the Pompton Queen. For the diner with the best aesthetics, Atlanta County's Silver Coin Diner. The sheer volume of neon and chrome truly screams diner to me, and the little blueberry mural added a local flair. For the diner with the best dessert, I have to give a nod to Middlesex County's Skylark Diner. That brookie skillet was the only dessert we didn't take to go, which was truly unparalleled. For the diner with the best soup, Somerset County's Time to Eat. Their seafood bisque is a very unique offering and absolutely worth stopping by on a Friday for. And finally, two related awards. For the best bang for your buck, there's no competition. Gloucester County's Angelo's Glassboro Diner. For the true budget buster, again, no competition. Hudson County's Topps Diner will set you back a pretty penny, but you'll have some of the best diner food you can get in the state. On that note, drum roll please, here are the final scores. Only 2.5 points separate the first and fourth place winners, so you can see how close this actually was. Maurice River Diner, 20 out of 25. Dino Seville Diner, 20.5 out of 25. Bayway Diner, 21.5 out of 25. Pumpton Queen Diner, 22.5 out of 25. The winner and the best diner in New Jersey award goes to Morris County's own Pumpton Queen Diner. Both meals we had there were among the best food we had the whole time, with my crepes being probably my best meal that I had for every diner we visited. The diner presented a diverse range of breakfast, lunch, dinner, and dessert options, something to please even the pickiest palate. And, and seriously, don't skip on the dessert here. I will be dreaming about that baklava cheesecake for probably the rest of my life. Thank you all for joining us on the Jersey Diner Challenge. I hope to be doing some more videos along this line, some slightly more scripted things going forward with more Jersey shenanigans and more niche travel. We'll see what happens. I'm Elise Explosion, and I'll see you next time.